So here we are, film animation, history and theory, week four. Um, pretty much I'm finishing off the golden age of animation and um, kind of plugging the gaps from last week. So apologies if it does seem a little bit higgledy-piggledy, but there were just sort of bits and pieces that I was uncomfortable that we'd missed. But in order to sort of plug the gaps, I'm having to kind of go back over things. So apologies for that. But anyway, at least less stuff is missed. No, it's kind of important stuff, I think. Right, yeah. So, um, last week, we it was the Golden Age of Animation, uh, part one. We looked at Walt Disney and his partner in crime, crime of Uix. We talk about a little bit about them this week, too, because there's still a few gaps. Um, and the originator of, um, or, or, or the first iteration of, of Mickey Mouse was called Ozzle the Rabbit. Uh, we looked at Mickey's early days, covered that, that a little bit this week too, which uh, surprised me how much there is. Um, the Fleischer Studios and their you know, early innovators, Snow White and the seven people of short stature, um, the, the creation of the multi-plane camera. We started to look at some of the, the early studios, MGM, Hanna-Barbera, and the animated shorts series, and Tex Avery, Chuck Jones, and Termite Terrace. So I think something kind of important happened around um, the start of the golden age of animation, where, you know, during the 1920s and when f f the film industry was really in its infancy, and people started making uh, feature length films. Um, animation during the 1920s um, hadn't quite got to that point. It was a bit of a sort of a, an unknown threshold. Um, in 1937, when Disney branched into feature film animation, and I talk a little bit more about that tonight, but there seemed to be this really obvious clear divide that there were um, high-end uh, crafted uh, feature films and then there were still these the these shorts and it seemed to be that there was and it's still around today you know people sort of talk about you know whether you work on feature films or you work on all the other stuff um, it seems to be um, still very much a divide. It certainly wasn't when, when I didn't think of it like that when um, I entered the industry and I never, I never ever thought, oh, I really aspire to being a feature film animator because it's better. Um, because I, I actually really liked um, the, the anime. I, I kind of grew up with all of the animated shorts that you see there on the screen. And I, and I, I really, kind of liked um, the sort of the rougher type of animation, I guess you'd call it, the more limited styles. Um, I actually found that the, the polish of the Disney stuff didn't really appeal to me as much. But there was absolutely this sort of, this, this big divide that um, animator and animation sort of kind of went in these sort of two directions. Um, and it really came, you know, in, in Snow White, 1937, was the, um, the, the first um, uh, feature film. And it also had the level of polish that had never been seen before. So, and I guess for me, the golden age of animation is, is really synonymous with the emergence of those um, uh, popular anthropomorphic animated characters like Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Donald Duck, Goofy, um, Popeye in some ways, but I guess he's a human character. Uh, Tom and Jerry, uh, you know, they, they stand upright. Um, whilst they don't talk, they, they stand upright like a, like a, like a, like a human. So it's that anthropomorphic, uh, quality. 
um, you know, uh, Porky Pig, Woody the Woodpecker, Betty Boop, Droopy, Mighty Mouse, Mr. Magoo, Pink Panther, Elmer Fudd, uh, George and Junior, which I think was kind of one of my favourite actually. Uh, and of course, Wiley uh, Wiley Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner, love them. Um, you know, they were just sort of they became household names, and they they all emerged in this that that ten year period between 1930 and 1940, the golden age where it ended, um, debatable. I would sort of say. I feel it, it ended in the 1960s, but there's some people might say that it, that it, it, it kind of ended in the 1970s. But I think there was a very much a, uh, for me, uh, there was a, de a decline in the golden age around the 1960s. We can talk about that. So let's have a look at the studios and what they were doing. So it's a, a slightly different look at, 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 at Disney. I know we've covered Disney a lot. Um, they had this um, this series uh, of animated shorts, 75 animated shorts produced by Walt Disney between 1929 and 1939. That's a phenomenal output. That is, and that isn't all they were doing. They were doing lots and lots of other stuff. Um, but these were the Silly Symphonies were a series of of uh, short. Um, films that accompanied uh, other films, so they were they were generally their their role was to um, be a support act to uh, main feature films. You certainly wouldn't have paid just to go and see shorts. Um, uh, the one thing that the that is important to note about the Silly Symphonies, as opposed to the other Disney work, is that um, all of they describe it as having uh, independent continuity and didn't um, feature continuing characters, such as there was a, another series they produced, the Mickey Mouse Shorts, where they had characters that were in every single um, uh, series, episode, um, with the Silly Symphonies, that you'd see a character that would only appear in that short and never come back again. Um, and it was like it was almost like a, a sort of a, a testing ground. The only character that uh, really made a reappearance and broke that rule was Donald Duck, because he made his first appearance in the Silly Symphony cartoon, uh, The Wise Little Hen, 1934. And it was obviously, a, you know, uh, past muster, and they thought, well, this guy's uh, works really well, and we can develop him into into something else. Um, Seven of those 75 shorts won uh, Academy Award for the best animated short film. So that's not, that's not too shabby um, in a 10 year period. Um, then there was the, the, the Mickey Mouse series of, of uh, animated shorts that they were producing at the same time. So we looked at this uh, quite a bit. So we all know Steamboat Willie 1928. Um, was the, the the first debut of of Mickey Mouse, although it wasn't his first film. It was his, it was his third film. Plain Crazy and uh, Galloping Gaucho were um, seen essentially as as, as screen tests, uh, and uh, the test audiences didn't really dig them so much. And so, um, Steamboat Willie uh, was was the first one with with uh, synchronized sound. Um, so that's an important landmark. But Steamboat Willie, really, really successful. So Walt went back and thought, hold on, we can do something with these other films that were, you know, we won't just throw them out. Um, so he went back and dubbed sound into them and released them. So Playing Crazy, Galloping Gaucho, and then the, uh, the, the completed The Barn Dance. So... This this meant that Mickey Mouse as a as a as a film star, and that was a really interesting thing. That Felix the Cat, previously had been the the first animated film star, um, now had a a serious competitor, um, and Mickey Mouse took over from Felix the Cat. So Felix the Cat emerged in um, uh, nineteen nineteen. Um, 
kind of had a sort of a, sort of ten years of of popularity. Um, did really really well um, uh, uh, for the Fleischers, um, but was you know essentially eclipsed and. Um, the studio that was producing Felix the Cat closed down. It wasn't wasn't Fleischer's. I made a mistake there. Um, this was an interesting fact that at first Mickey was drawn by Disney's longtime partner and friend Abbe Books, and um, who was also a, you know, a fairly serious technical innovator in the world of, of animation. So it's important to know and and to give him his place in that. But this fact that he used to average about 600 drawings a day uh, is incredible. Um, and, you know, he was sort of thought of as being the, you know, the, the, uh, the craft animator responsible for, for bringing things to life. And, and Walt was responsible for uh, the broader ideas of the cartoons. So, Simon? Yeah. So what would you say would be like the work hours like Ab um, did <laughs> to, to output like 600 drawings? Ridiculous. Well, they say that there's, there's some evidence to suggest that when they were designing uh, Mickey Mouse and Ab Iwix, there's, there's lots of um, different theories around that. But the popular one is that Ab Iwix was the, was the main... Uh, designer of Mickey Mouse, and that they used to use coins, particular two coins that were popular at the time, and that the the proportions of the ears to the head, because when Mickey turns his head, he doesn't it doesn't it it, it sort of stays quite round, and the features slide around, and the ears do this sort of weird thing like that. They don't they don't twist in in location, and that clever little device actually allowed them to 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 um, be quite quick um, but and also they they animated in a straight ahead manner all that rubber hose stuff was was really straight ahead so they could be really quick but um, yeah they they wouldn't have line tested because you know um, and what I mean by line testing is was a thing that we used to do we used to, we used to shoot everything on on um, on video and um, we were able to test out our timing so you could hold a drawing for four or six or eight or whatever and you could you could see the timing and you could go back and adjust it and then then go and in between it these guys had no idea they would they were they were sort of firing blind in, in a way um, because they you know film was expensive it was a new medium they wouldn't have wouldn't have had that that ability to line test, so they would have just be really winging it, which is quite extraordinary if you think about it. That we get to test and test and test. They were all of that rubber hose stuff was shot straight ahead, so that's quite quite unusual. I didn't answer your question. Sorry, I don't know how many hours. Of, I think they I think they worked a lot, but you know, animators always have done. So, nineteen twenty nine was a, uh, a, re a really s significant world event happened, which was the stock market crash on Wall Street brought about uh, the Great Depression, 1929. When we had the global financial crisis in uh, 2008, I remember thinking, wow, we're, about, we're actually about to see uh, world history because that was the biggest stock market crash since this time. But this was massive. It was, it was um, significantly life-changing for pretty much everybody. There was so much unemployment um, and it was really unsettling and you know, changed world events. Uh, the 1920s were incredibly affluent, very, very decadent. Um, there was a lot of optimism around too much optimism and uh, for whatever reasons I don't even understand the, the economics of it but there was this uh, massive global great depression and um, you know lots and lots of companies thousands of companies went out of business 
thousands, millions of people would have been unemployed. Very, very desperate times. But interestingly enough, and I remember this significantly from history at school, that the one industry that survived on a broader scale, the entertainment industry survived, but in particular, the film industry in the 1930s absolutely flourished. And the reason being is people were, they, they just needed cheering up. So if you think about it, you know, these, these studios like Disney's and MGM, Warner Brothers were, were, were pioneers. They were spending a lot of money uh, developing product for an audience that essentially was broke. But um, as a bit, it, was, it was such an anomaly that the film industry uh, was booming in the 1930s uh, in contrast to almost every other industry uh, that, would, that had gone broke. And it was literally just because people uh, needed entertainment more than ever. So it was, it was a, it's a significant thing. And it's, I think it's really important to, to mention in, in your, in your research and, 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 and your learnings that, that the socioeconomic um, uh, events have these, these uh, uh, knock-ons, this cause and effect. And I think it's really important to, to notice that. You know, there were, there were, there were other in, you know, significant events. I thought, well, you know, when I used to teach advertising, I talk about this and how the advent of the radio and, and advertising was really significant at this time too. But um, yeah. So, still talking about Disney, the Mickey Mouse series as opposed to the Silly Symphonies, which was running concurrently. Um, you know, Walt we'll, we'll continued to develop and add characters, which um, created you know, new characters such as uh, Pluto, and Goofy, and Donald Duck in 1934. Um, so he's adding these um, continuous characters that are turning up in every series as opposed to the Silly Symphonies, which just, there was no continuity between, between them. So that's kind of important. Um, 1937, we've covered this a lot, uh, the first feature film, um, and Walt Disney was convinced that short cartoons weren't enough to keep his studio afloat to make sure that they were being profitable. So he took what you know everyone thought was going to be an enormous gamble. And you, you can imagine people would have been incredibly risk adverse at this point. You know, people have you know been um, really suffering for you know uh, eight years at this point. Um, and you know, there wasn't any much sign of things improving. Um, you know, America didn't come out of, uh, the great depression until the second world war a year later. So there was, there was no end in sight and the world would have been a really unstable place. Um, so to take such a leap of faith, I think is quite important. You know, he's probably doing all right with the shorts, but Snow White is an, is a, is a huge leap from this stuff um you know from essentially making the support act to um to his work and essentially um mickey mouse it was it was the merchandising that that was that was paying the bills so you know critics thought that snow white would be a, a massive financial ruin for the studio and it would be the end of the Walt Disney studio. Um, they said that the colours were too bright. You imagine they're only just getting into colour at this point. Colour wasn't, colour wasn't really, it was possible but it wasn't that common, um, even for feature films. Um, you know, colour really didn't come into its own in a very mainstream kind of way until the mid 50s 60s you know people were still making a lot of black and white films back then so the fact that this was full color would have would have been quite 
quite a bold thing. It would have been actually really quite garish. Um, and they thought that people would just, you know, they could handle, you know, six minutes of, uh, um, of slapstick and gags. Uh, but a feature film le uh, uh, length of them, they thought it was just going to be too much. So they thought, that, you know, the format and everything was, was, was going to be a disaster. However, they were all wrong. Snow White was a, a, a worldwide uh, box, office, box office success um, and a significant landmark in the development of animation as a serious art form. You know, they'd been learning their craft on the Silly Symphonies and, and the, the early uh, Mickey Mouse stuff and then the Mickey Mouse series. And then they were really putting it to the test. There were a lot of um, uh, rapid innovations. There was the multi-plane camera, which was invented by Fleischers, but, you know, the Disney guys uh, took it to the next level. Colour was uh, a significant thing. You know, they were talking, you know, about here, I think this is in the poster, uh, uh, in, you know, multi-plane technicolor. That was sort of like, wow, this is, this is, this is quite, quite, a, uh, uh, quite a product. So after the success of Snow White, um, they went on to make Pinocchio. What happened in 1939? Can anyone think of what, what was significant that happened in 1939 that might be um, uh, affect things. So we had 1929. We had the stock market crack crash, um, and that was that was a significant. <laughs> well done, Sarah. Um, started not. Oh yeah, sorry, you just answered that. I was gonna say, Sarah, no, it started then. <laughs> Yes, yes, it started. So, you know, Snow White, massive, um, cost of fortune. They went, all right, okay, did well. After the success of Snow White, Disney went and produced Pinocchio, uh, which was released in 1940. It was considered, again, another massive uh, technical and artistic um, leap costing twice as much as Snow White. So it's really capitalizing on that, um, you know, pushing things to the nth degree. Um, interestingly enough, how Snow White was a, um, we always think, it's impossible to think in these days to think of Snow White without thinking of Walt Disney. Um, and I think most people forget that it was um, an old European folk tale by the Brothers Grimm as was Pinocchio. So Disney, are, you know, are using that formula of, of uh, um, raiding the, um, uh, the treasure trove of European folk tales for, for their work. But what they hadn't banked on, that 1939, World War breaks out, no one saw it coming. Well, I guess maybe they didn't, I don't know. Um, whilst America wasn't in the war at that time and maybe they were just thinking well let's hope nothing hope it isn't that bad you know and particularly in 1939 there was a lot of talk of oh well it'll it'll, it'll be a flash in the pan it'll be over by christmas there was a, there was a lot of that stuff going on but they release pinocchio and the second world war um essentially meant that the the european release uh didn't happen um, and so it cut off 40% of uh, the revenue from overseas releases. So it meant that Pinocchio, um, you know, uh, was, was not, uh, I think, and I think it actually just about broke even, I can't remember, but it, it, it certainly wasn't the, the success of um, the financial success that uh, Snow White was. Later that year, they produced... Fantasia. Um, Fantasia is a really kind of, it's a weird film. I've never quite got Fantasia because it's, it's like lots of movies all blended together. Um, and I've, I've never quite understood it. It was this sort of, um, I guess it was a sort of 
artistic triumph and trying to push the medium as much as it could. But as far as a story goes, it, it, it doesn't fit together. It's not meant to fit together. Uh, the fact that it's essentially eight uh, animated segments that sit together and you know, that, that, that sit next to each other and sort of edited together. Um, they're all based on, you know, classical music. So, you know, things like Night on Bald Mountain. Um, how does that, and I've always thought, how does that fit into the Sorcerer's Apprentice? It's weird. It's always sort of blew my mind. It was a bit kind of trippy. Um, but essentially, um, he produced Fantasia. It originally began as, uh, with a, 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 the Mickey Mouse cartoon um, in an attempt to recapture his dwindling popularity. Imagine Mickey Mouse had been this massive character and there had been a sharp decline due, due to Max Fleischer uh, was producing uh, Popeye. Um, and there was also Donald Duck was on the ascent. And so Disney was, was trying to create a film, create a platform for, uh, for, Walt, for uh, Mickey Mouse. And, and absolutely, The Sorcerer's Apprentice is, is a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a textbook for um, genius animation of, you know, and, and, it, and it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible sequence. So there's, there's, some, there's some amazing sequences in, in Fantasia. But for me, as an as a overall experience, it doesn't, yeah, I find it weird. I don't know discuss um in 1941 uh, in order to compensate for the, uh, the poor box offices uh, um, uh, of, of Pinocchio and Fantasia Disney produced this low budget feature film Dumbo and it's always been cited as this sort of um, sort of kind of this lesser film that um, it was essentially to just throw some product out there um, just to uh, make some money. And, you know, the Disney name was, was obviously, you know, um, very well regarded and that anything they produced was, was going to make um, an impact. And they thought if we can just, we can just create a film um, and, you know, people will almost go and see anything, you know, it's, the, it's, it's wartime. So they, 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 they they're going to, uh, go out and see things. Um, interestingly enough, um, just a few days after all of you know the the, the rough uh, line tests and the animatics were were completed, um, there was this interesting um, thing that they call it the uh, the Disney animators strike, uh, and that broke out. Whereas it was essentially um, the whole studio uh, effectively uh, put pencils down because it was a it was a highly unionized workforce and it wasn't just Disney it was the it was the the whole uh, animation industry in the states um, essentially went out on strike for better wages because they had been working incredibly hard and they probably you know had seen all of the great profits they've been doing it for essentially decades at that point, you know, that, you know, in 1938, there had been you know, an animation film industry um, for 20 years. Um, and they were, they were seeing the cut, the studios creating big profits, the, um, the, you know, the, 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 the live action f uh, studios were making big profits and the animators were, were just always seen at the bottom of the pile and weren't getting the kind of recognition um, and the financial rewards that um, people in, in live action were getting. And so essentially they, uh, they all went out on strike. And so it was significant because it changed um, the, the studio structure. And it, it wasn't just Disney. It was, it was, it was a, every studio was affected by it. And there was, this essentially a reshuffling of key personnel. And this is the point I got to last week when I was trying to make sense of this. And I was thinking it's, it just like, it's like it almost sort of reshuffled the pack of what was happening. Cause it was, it was hard to sort of draw clear lines of who worked, worked where, cause essentially 
some studios went back, went broke. Um, some people broke off and formed their other studios. Some people swapped studios. So it was, it was really difficult to try and make sense out of that. Um, the Fleischer studios were impacted in subtle ways as well, probably less subtle ways as well. Um, so the Fleischer studios, we've talked a lot. They were, you know, uh, have been in operation, um, you know, since uh, um, 1919. Um, have been, you know, operated by um, Max and Dave Fleischer, and had scored phenomenal hits with, you know, Betty Boop and Popular Sailor. You've got to bear in mind, Popeye in the 1930s was rivaling Mickey Mouse as a film star, and that's how they thought of these characters. They they were very much in the in in, in of of the mind that when you had a successful character, it was like. Um, owning a film star and you've got to bear in mind the studio the studio systems back in the 1930s were incredibly territorial about their talent so that if you were a film star and you were signed to MGM or if you were signed to Warner Brothers you were their property and you were locked into some fairly aggressive contracts um, and they saw their 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 their, their developed characters um, very much as as as, uh, as 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 property and um, and and uh, their 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 cash cow. So the competition between Popeye the Sailor and Mickey Mouse would have been ferocious. The competition between Fleischer's out on the East Coast and Disney's out on the West Coast would have been phenomenal. But you know. Popeye the Sailor becoming really popular, and that's essentially we, we touched on it earlier, where um, uh, Disney are then creating um, uh, films such as Fantasia to try and raise Mickey's profile because you know the shorts had had, had been and gone, and, and his popularity had dropped off. Interestingly enough, uh, and we talked about this last week as well, that in the 1930s, in 1934 there was this um, uh, changing of, uh, of, of the film production code. They called it the Hayes Code. Um, and it was this uh, moralization of, of film content. And um, essentially, the, a lot of the content um, that was produced in the 19, in 1920s, and the 1920s were an interesting time. You know, sort of um, people were really out there. They were, they were, they were, um, there was a, you know, different morals back then, and really significantly different from the 1930s. So that the Hayes Code came in, and essentially um, curtailed. Um, what people could produce. So um, the the general f sort of feeling of a Fleischer's film is it had a lot of adult themes. There were, you know, they weren't necessarily cartoons for kids. There was a lot of violence. There was a, a, a very much, it was a an adult, um, uh, product and um, th what the Hayes code did was meant they had to dial it all down um, where Disney had always um, apart from apart from maybe one or two of those early Mickey Mouse films but essentially the, the Disney people were very much um, that sentimental family entertainment kind of style so that contributed to um, the uh, the the ending of the Fleischer Studio. So Fleischer Studios produced three Technicolor features: Pop Popeye meet, Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor, 1936. Popeye the Sailor meets meets Ali Baba's Forty Thieves in 1937, and the third Popeye film, Aladdin, Aladdin and His Wonderful Lamp. So. Like I said, the Fleischer Studio was um, characterized by its very, very much adult themes. 
and a, and a, and a particular kind of sensibility. Its animation was kind of rougher and, and, and grittier. It, it you know had much sort of grittier kind of um, uh, subject matter. You know, they, you know, they very much showed uh, the sort of rougher side of life. I mean, even Popeye. I mean, Popeye is a, you know, he's 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 kind of a rough and tumble kind of guy that you know eats his spinach and punches people. You know, he's a, he's 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 a he's a he's a sort of a tough character, and he's always kind of getting into into scraps, and it's considered quite normal. Where Disney characters sort of didn't do that. Disney had, you know, it was much more friend, sort of family friendly, a higher level of focus on the craft of animation, where Fleischer's didn't really have that craft aspect. Um, Disney shorts were a lot more anthropomorphic, whilst Fleisch, Fleischer's always had human characters. So there was this big Big divide. I know Mark um, Pulley Blanks mentioned this sort of idea uh, with you as well about the different um, types of films that were made on each coast of the States. 1939, um, Fleischer's made this really interesting film called Gulliver's Travels. And whether it was because of the animator's strike or whether they were just trying to um, innovate new techniques, but they invented this thing called rotoscoping. And I thought, wouldn't it be easier just to film an, an actor doing some action, and then we can just trace over the top. We can bang this stuff out quicker, and it would look realistic, um, and we could probably compete with the craft of, of Disney, maybe. They also did something really other else that was really interesting the studio had always been based in um in new york and in the late 1930s they moved everyone the whole studio lock stock and barrel they, they 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 shipped it all down to miami because um they had different labor laws in miami and so that they could effectively get around some of the uh, unionization of, of uh, that was happening across the rest of the states. So eff effectively, they could carry on really not paying people properly. Um, so that was a kind of a significant thing that this this unionization that was that was that was cropping up. Um, so 1939, Gulliver's Travels, right, using a rotoscope, and then. In 1941 to 1942, they made the first animated Superman film. Um, and some sort of complicated stuff happened. They, they, they kind of s sort of sold a lot of the assets and the rights to the studio. And um, they became, they, the, the, essentially they lost the name Fleischer Studios and they became famous studios. And it gets really messy and they just, they evolve into lots of different, areas so it's, it's sort of you lose the thread of of what Fleischer's were um, so I, I sort of leave that there I leave Fleischer's at, at uh, making Superman in 1942 um, what a lot of the studios did and I haven't got it in my presentation but a lot of the studios got involved with the war effort so they were making propaganda films Dis they all did it Disney's did it Fleischer's did it, or, or famous uh, studios as they were then then known as, would make um, propaganda films. Like Popeye was a uh, a character used. They they enlisted him in into the navy, and he did did a lot of. Um, you know how they would uh, send uh, film stars and different performers to go and perform for the troops. That's essentially what they did with Popeye. They basically made you know him a. a, a somebody to uh, boost the morale of the, of the sailors. So essentially they put him into the Navy and they made these sort of um, kind of entertainment films and propaganda films for the, uh, for the American Navy, for the US Navy. Okay. The start of Warners is, was a little bit difficult to pin down, but essentially 
um, the initial um, uh, s spark for for the what we think of as being the Warner Brothers studio. You got to think, remember, Warners were making feature films. They were, they were, they were, you know, doing. They weren't necessarily making animated films. Um, so the the initial spark came from two animators that uh, had uh, left Disney's um, in in you know in nineteen twenty nine. Um, essentially, they came up with this character called Bosco the Talk Ink Kid. This idea that it's ink, it's talking, it's a terrible idea, I know. Um, and they tried to sell it to a distributor in nineteen thirty. However. Um, Warner Brothers, who had previously tried unsuccessfully to set up a cartoon studio in New York in order to kind of compete with the early Disney product, agreed to distribute the series. Um, they brought in this guy, and he's, he's, he's an absolute uh, legendary figure in, in, for this period. It's impossible to talk about Warner Brothers or the golden age of animation without talking about Leon Schlesinger. Um, and they brought him in to essentially um, guide these two animators and they created Lo Looney Tunes. And it was essentially, you know, in uh, as a rival thing. So they're all borrowing off each other, they're all into this sort of kind of competition. If one person does one something, the other one will, will try and sort of say, oh, well, that works, we'll try something else. So, you know, Disney's have made silly symphonies, so they sort of sat around and went, oh, well, let's make, I oh, know, let's make Looney Tunes. That sounds a bit like silly symphonies. It's a, it's a terrible connection. And um, then they made another series called Merry Melodies. You see, there's this weird little thing theme going on between silly symphonies and Looney Tunes and Merry, Merry, Merry Melodies. Um, you know, and again, they were very much, you know, a, um, uh, a strong uh, sort of um, kind of connection or influence to those those Disney films of that period. So those two guys, Harmon and Isling, parted company with Schlesinger in 1933, and they 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 took their star. You know, remember that they're. That their, 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 their character is like a movie star. They went, you know, we've fallen out with you financially. Um, and clearly the studios weren't paying particularly well. Um, and they, they took Bosco with them and they went over to MGM, Metro Goldman, Golden Mayor. And Schlesinger uh, essentially created his own cartoon studio. And when we think of Warner Brothers, we're talking about... Uh, Leon Schlesinger Productions. Essentially, we you know it was the back lot of the Warner Brothers uh, film studios, where all the the glamorous uh, uh, film stars were. Out in the back was Termite Terrace, and that was you now this producer, Leon Schlesinger. I can never say his name. Uh, was creating these 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 animated shorts, these six minute animated shorts, six minutes turned around every six six weeks, just product just to um, pump out onto the screen and sort of keep people happy while they're um, as the support act. So early 30s, he brings in the legendary Tex Avery, who is put in charge of this low budget Looney Tunes, this rundown building that the, you know, these these skanky animators, they were they, they had no respect. Um, and they were just badly paid, and they were just out there working in, in this in this flea pit called Termite Terrace. And under Tex Avery, they brought in you know characters like Porky Pig, who had replaced the character they had lost. Um, Bosco, they 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 created they they made a um, uh, a replacement called Buddy, and didn't work out. So Porky Pig then replaced that character, um, and this was the first Warner Brothers cartoon character to have any kind of star power that would vaguely um, compete with Mickey Mouse or Felix the Cat or Betty Boop. It was there, it was, you know, you know, essentially Porky Pig was their guy. So 
Tex Avery, like everyone else was trying to repeat, you know, copy everyone else. Tex Avery couldn't give a shit. He was, you know, that's why he's important because everyone else is trying to copy and trying to build on what everyone else is doing. Tex Avery brought in this surreal kind of crazy wacky style. He went, you know, it's, it's animation. We can do anything in here. So that's what he did. That's what his, his signature style was, um, you know, developing characters like Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. So um, now we go and have a quick look at the other big studio at the time that was making shorts. Um, after parting ways with Walt Disney in 1930, his mate Ub Iwix went to work for MGM producing animated shorts. He, he tried setting up his own studio for a while and that didn't work, but then he went over to um, MGM um, and making these, you know, these characters that everyone's forgotten about, Flip the Frog and Willy Whopper for MGM. Um, so none of that was successful. They couldn't really match, you know, their competitor Disney or the Fleischer cartoons. Um, and, you know, after MGM dropped Iwix, they hired Harmon and Isling and brought him away from Leon Schlesinger. Like, like I said, things get really confusing because people are just moving around all over the place. Um, and um, so, they, so they hired Harmon and Isling away from Warner's and appointed them heads of the studio. And they took their character, that, remember that character, Bosco, and they started producing this thing called Bosco and the Happy Harmony. So that thing, that thing of copying Disney silly symphonies and then Looney Tunes and the uh, Merry Melodies, there's another one now called you know, the Happy Harmonies. Um, it's ridiculous. They're all just sort of plagiarizing each other. So um, kind of kind of strange. Uh, however, they failed to make a success in theatres. And in 1937, Bosco and the Happy Har Harmony series was discontinued. And MGM replaced uh, Harmon and Isling with this guy called Fred Quimby. Now, Fred Quimby, you'd recognize him in all the titles. I remember growing up, just remember watching this 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 name it just sort of it's etched into my little kind of i don't know um 10 year old brain um I remember thinking just remember this name and he was he was the producer that um started developing uh, uh characters like tom and jerry in in the late 30s there was Oh, I changed a slide and it's not there. How annoying. I got confused then. There was, there was, the, the images are supposed to be different. I've made a mistake. It's all right. It doesn't matter. Uh, in 1939, he brought in these two producers, this guy called William Hanna, Joseph Barbera, and they started uh, a partnership that would last for six decades until one of them passed away in the early 2000s. So... Um, they came up with this character called Puss Gets the Boot in 1940, featuring an unnamed mouse's attempt to outwit a cat named Jasper. Uh, you know, they just sort of tried it out, didn't think, didn't know how it was going to go, um, didn't really spend a lot of time developing it, but it became this massive success, financially and critically successful, earning uh, an, an, an Oscar nomination for the best short uh, in 1940. Um, and on the strength of the Oscar nomination and the public demand, Hannah and Barbera set themselves up, produced that long running cat and mouse cartoon, uh, calling mm -hmm. their characters Tom and Jerry. And what would the world be without Tom and Jerry? Oh, that's that's, that's, that's probably like awesome. most, Simon. Yeah, that's probably like my most favorite cartoon. Uh, like growing up, even now as well, like Tom and Jerry. I think it was for me too. I remember just sitting with my brother um, on Saturday mornings with a bowl of cornflakes, sitting in front of the telly, watching um, watching this stuff. And that's when I think names like. Hanna Barbera has just got etched into my brain, and Fred Quimby. That's like that stuff. I just—they're just household names for me. From just 
I didn't even know what it, when it was this direct order or produced by, I didn't know what that meant. As far as I was concerned, if you didn't draw the cartoons, what else did you do? Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is the slide I got confused with. So, uh, so in its original run, Hanna-Barbera produced 114 Tom and Jerry shorts for MGM from 1940 to 1958. And during this time, they won seven Oscars for uh, animated shorts, tying first place with Walt Disney's Silly Symphonies for the most awards in that category. So, Tom and Jerry, yeah, massive. Um, and it was after 1958, they just shut the studio down and, 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 and completely stopped. Um, all right, so Tex Avery came to MGM from Warner's um, in 1942 to re revitalize their studio with the same spark it in, infused into the, the Warner's animation. Like I said, it gets confusing because they all move around because you know they, they, they crack the shits with uh, their current studio. The money's not good enough. They go, I'm going to go and work over there. Um, so it's, all, it's, it's sort of confusing to nail these people down to one studio. So 1942, Tex Avery comes across and he brings his wild, surreal uh, way of looking at the world, his, you know, you know, he's, he, he doesn't want to do anything sentimental. He doesn't want to do anything like Disney. He's a complete nutcase. And he sort of, he, he really wants to um, set up these new standards and challenge all of this sort of that new, uh, what they call the entertainment uh, code era, the Hayes code, and try different stuff and, you know, try and, try and do things which adults are going to really dig Kids are going to dig it because it's a cartoon, but ultimately his, his target audience is this, this utter chaotic, anarchic mayhem. Um, it was, he never, ever thought it was going to be for kids. Um, so in 1953, uh, unfortunately, uh, MGM closed down the Tex Avery unit. Re Fred Quimby retired in 1955. Uh, and uh, with Hanna-Barbera replacing him in charge in, 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 in the remaining MGM cartoons. And they essentially um, continued uh, cartoons until 1957, when the studio shut down the uh, Hanna-Barbera unit, ending all animation for MGM. So they were, they were you know, a significant player in producing these shorts, but they just decided in 1957 um, they weren't going to produce shorts anymore. And I was going to mention something else. I'll get into that later. This is for me, one of the most interesting periods of animation. It's what's known as the UPA style, the United Productions of America. And it was an, a, a really curious animation studio that uh, was, it, it, it's, it's, its inception was quite loose. It, it, you know, it's hard to kind of say it started at this one point with this person, particular person. It just was this loose um, uh, combination of, of, of animators and creators and producers that came together and started um, this independent uh, animation studio called the United Productions of America. And they really came out of that idea that the, that the big studios, Disney's, Warner's and MGM were um, essentially not treating people very well. And they were absolutely, you know, they were, they were notorious. They were notorious for treating their film stars really badly. And clearly they, if they, you know, they absolutely had no regard for animation. You know, they, you know, think about termite terrace. They couldn't even build them a nice, nice place to work. It was just this shithole out the back that, that no one really wanted to be. It would have been horrible. So they started drifting in towards this place called UPA. Um, and during the 1940s, they, they, they produced some really interesting um, work for the war effort. Um, and there's some, some interesting, you know, sort of that educational stuff that, 
the, the you know uh, for, for army training films and you know that that stuff like loose lip lip sync ships you know that sort of you know be careful what conversations you have all that sort of war effort not really propaganda but it was that war effort communication um and that's the work they initially did but after the war they started producing some really graphically interesting work um that they they were they 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 thought of as being the uh um innovating a brand new graphic style which very much looked like the graphic style that was was popular in the 1950s you can see there's a, a, a stylistic change um things look very very different you know after the first world war we had a stylistic change in in all forms of visual media in you know in typography in graphic design in architecture in interior design in 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 fashion in in music things change after a big event like that and the same thing came out of um that happened for um for, for in animation you know the war was a period of 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 austerity and economy and they produced this animation style to fit that it was very very what they call limited um limited in its style and they turned it into a stylistic kind of signature um so you know they often get overshadowed because of all of the sort of the uh, commercial success um and the big juggernaut of you know the big three you know warner's mgm and disney but um i think the the cultural um impact of upa has been really long lasting that a lot of people refer back to it and you see it coming up in people like um uh ren and stimpy and things like that you, you can sort of see you can see absolutely see uh a lot of people referencing it um and a lot of my favorite illustrators will will reference this this UPA style so absolutely you know they they they're considered innovators in animation style in content and in technique um and their style was um was was borrowed and it it's sort of seen as a style that really came into its own in the 50s 60s and 70s and initially it might have been a uh, Uh, an ec economic measure of turning stuff around really fast but it very quickly became stylistic choice um and uh, you know sort of it's very much got that that kind of 1950s 60s kind of minimalistic uh feel to it um i i love it i'm a massive fan of the upa style i i just i absolutely love it and I think last last trimester I I I I gave you the link to Gerald McBoinboin. Go and watch it. It's fantastic. The Boinboin show. Bailey's popped up. Have you got a mouthful of food? Your Uber Eats turned up. He's probably telling the family to keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so I do I do apologize. Um any questions? The questions are what have you been talking about for the past hour? Um look I there's so much more I could talk about with this this uh golden age of animation. We can kind of get into you know some of the work of Hanover Bearers but I I I I but they 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 had a um a fantastic canon of work uh through through the 70s and 80s you know things like you know, Scooby Doo and um lots of stuff that had this and 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 you can sort of see they they kind of evolved that UPA style that economy style um using um replacement mails and um you know sort of uh creating libraries of animation and 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 i think there's there's something really beautiful about economic animation that it doesn't like not everything has to be moving all of the time they'll do thing that classic stuff where you know a character will form a pose 
and it'll strike a pose and it's a really good pose it tells the story and then there's some dialogue and it will just be in a look um and it's 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 just utterly beautiful stuff and i think you really need to go and look at it again if you haven't already and just be aware of that economy um it's i think it's i think it's fantastic and it's i think it's probably why i've never you know as a kid i never really liked disney i never really liked the full animation style i've always i think liked that graphic limited style of 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 upa but you know i've got to be careful that i don't push my taste upon on, on my students it's something i remind myself of as much as i can so if the upa style is not your thing i apologize for my uh got interrupted by my enthusiasm as a uh, as i like to say any questions No, not, none for me. I've just been finding it really interesting, really, because I've never really, like, digged in, like, the history of film or animation or anything like that. Um, and as I'm, like, doing this assignment, it's like, whoa, there's actually so much that happened in, like, like a hundred-year, you know, period. And how things, like, evolved so quickly in, uh, you know, certain certain gates it's been good i've been able to dig out all my animation books i've got one here on the fleischers this this is a cracker so i've had this for, for quite some time um oh my god there's notes in here mm -hmm. there's the obituary of grim network he worked at the same studio I worked at. He animated. He worked, He started off at Fleischer's animating um, Betty Boop, and um, he finished up on The Thief and the Cobbler. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I think you're right, Leon. It's it's really it's really good to inform yourself of 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 things of what where we've come from, where, you know, you, you, you can't move forward until you know the past. And, you know, like, like I said, you know, when, when, there's, when there's significant changes in things like a world war or a global recession or um, a trade union movement, for instance, that are kind of essentially in the 1930s that that unionization of the workforce just meant that people got shuffled up it was this i think we're all afraid of change i, I know i know i have an apprehension of change but then it it's interesting how it it forces some innovation um that we we we, we get something new and interesting turn up I think. I guess like one of the things that surprised me um, at the moment is like, because a lot of the animation that I watched, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s were actually made like in the 50s and 60s. But because I was like introduced to it like way later, I just assumed it was like made like around that time when I was, you know, watching them. And then now, like doing a bit more research, I was like, "Whoa, some of these animations are actually pretty old, like decades old." Yeah, I know it's ridiculous. Like Tom and Jerry, it's seriously old. Yeah, you know, it's and it's only as a kid when you're sort of sitting there, you know, with your breakfast cereal on Saturday morning, just kind of like watching this stuff, and you kind of go, "Oh yeah, this is just it's just sort of movement and color," and you go, "Oh right, okay," and this sort of this this cat's trying to absolutely murder a mouse and you just go that's fine yeah. <laughs> but there's there's a whole bunch of really inappropriate things that goes on in in, in tom and jerry like they they have a, an africa african-american housekeeper that really is not 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 kind of that great really this idea that 
people of color are there to serve. And that was absolutely running, running in the background, which is bizarre. But, you know, this, you, you couldn't, you, 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 you wouldn't, you wouldn't get it past anyone now. That's that's quite funny that you mentioned that because um, that that was actually school, like kind of the culture like in South Africa until like even the nineties like like nineties. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess it didn't like really clicked that it wasn't like the way it's supposed to be <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, um, when I, I I was born in Botswana. And um, really, yeah. Uh, wow. When Botswana used to be British, it was called the the British Protectorate of Botswana Land. And um, this is going to sound shocking, but um, my, my 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 parents worked for the government. My dad was a, a policeman, uh, and my 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 mother worked for the um, uh, literally worked for the government. And so we, I, I grew up in, 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 a, in, a, in a house where we had um, colored servants, which sounds, sounds appalling. I shudder, I shudder at the thought of it. Um, but uh, because I was just hanging out in the garden, playing, playing with their kids that were just, you know, you know the kids are kids, you're just, you're just playing. And, my mother was absolutely horrified when the first, do you know the first thing I said to my mother? And she used to remind me of this, was I was playing underneath a table and she said, oh, come on, get, get out from underneath there. And I, I, I turned around to her and spoke to her in, in clear Setswana, bugger off or I'll hit you. <laughs> She probably turned around and hit you. <laughs> but she, she had no, because you know, kid, kids, kids aren't racist. You know, the kids are just yeah. <laughs> hanging out with the kid, kids. At the end, of the, you know, sort of just around, and so I, I picked up at Swan and before I spoke English. <laughs> That's quite funny. <laughs> but there you go. Um, yeah, and I think I think those kind of. Yeah, it may be right. I don't know. I'll riff on that another time. The rest of you are being ever so quiet. What's going on? I'm eating dinner. <laughs> what are you having? What do you? What have you got? Spaghetti bowl. It's really good. Make it yourself? Nah, my partner made it. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Monday, Tuesdays are his nights because I have class. Oh, so good. He gets a bit salty, but it's fine. <laughs> very good. Very good. Is it always spaghetti bol- yep. bolognese? No. <laughs> I mean, last week it was enchiladas and curry. And I think tomorrow night it'll probably be nachos. Maybe. We'll see. Very good. Bailey, what are you eating for dinner? Uh, a bit of schnitzel and uh, some veggies. That's what I've got. That's really good. I think it's really funny. We're talking about the the Uber Eats thing and the and how how sort of common it is now that when I'm like when I go out around the city and, and like literally just Uber Eats people, delivery people, just everywhere. Like your car surrounded by them. And um, the, a, a few of the lecturers have been having their students. You know, Uber Eats people have come onto campus and delivered food to their students in the middle of a class. Is this that? Is, is that mental? I was kind of horrified <laughs> when I found that out. Um, That's weird. That's next level. Yeah, it's it's pretty. It's pretty kind of like I'm pretty laid back. But I don't I don't know if if I dig that so much. I don't think I go so well with that. In class, yeah. it's okay with you guys because I can't see you. <laughs> True. Tom, what, are you, what, what are you, have you got for dinner? 
Um, I'm having pork chops and some veggies afterwards. So. Very nice. Very nice. My wife has, has got a pie. A meat pie. Nice. Well, what veggies. kind of pie? Pie flavour. I don't know. <laughs> what do you say? Pie flavour. <laughs> I, I pie. Yeah. And... <laughs> But she's she's starting a new job this week, and um, she's she's going to be working out of this social enterprise place that has a organic food place in it. So she's just um, <laughs> it's uh, so she's bringing home lots of organic veggies. So, uh, like, I think she's going to turn me into a vegetarian, which would probably be good, but you know. Who just quoted that? I did. What was what was that? What did I miss? It's this really dumb YouTube. Like it's on YouTube. Like I don't even know. It's like a compilation of what would you even call it, Tom? Just like stickmen. Um, it's called Astef movie. Um, a guy named Tom Scar made all of these Astef movies. It's just different, um, you know, short animations. And one of them, I think, opens up with the. I baked you a pie. Oh boy, what what flavor? Pie flavor. It's so good. Um, so I, I, think I didn't I didn't understand what you're saying. So I'm I'm out of the loop with meat because I don't I don't meet people for a few days. <laughs> I like to know what the kids are thinking and doing. I'm sure he's got a video where it's just um compl- like put all the movies together. So I'll leave a link to that. It'll be somewhere in there. Because I don't remember what movie it is. What else do we know? I'll say a blanket, a blanket comment is I've been this morning and last night I was just chuckling at my emails because I had so many e- contrite emails of people that were uh, saying, I'm really sorry, I didn't get my stuff in and... Um, it's going to be late. I'm going to put it on. I'm, I'm, I'm hand it in tonight. So if you are one of those contrite people, that's fine. I'll call them out, Simon. There's only six of us. Go on. We want names. That would be pernicious and borderline <laughs> bullying. Uh, I'm one of them, and I'm actually wondering if I can defer if it's unless it's too late. Because I only just found out that the census date's just been and gone. I didn't realise. Mm. Let's Rough. talk to Morris, Sarah. Okay. Yes, it's probably, yeah, an offline kind of thing. Yep. So um, send me an email or something. I'll get I'll get to that. Tomorrow. I think I've got a dentist appointment tomorrow, but I don't know when. 2.30? So. Oh. No, it's not. I think it's 12.30. But I have had my wisdom poof pulled out before at 2.30. 2 <laughs> <laughs> oh, Give me a few seconds to get that. I love that joke. <laughs> have you never heard that, Leon? No. I got that straight away. Someone pulled that on me once. Working in a dental practice, that's all I used to hear, like, every day. <laughs> Twice, yeah, once a day. Someone come in. <laughs> it's always like a dad too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> that is Bloody so, hell. But it's funny. Um, that really is all folks. I love it? the Looney Tunes. So, so who went to the movies? <laughs> sorry? Who went to the movies? Like this week for the. I didn't stuff. get many receipts. I, was say. I did, but I didn't get a receipt. <laughs> you did I had to go twice. I texted you my receipt, but I d- and then I totally forgot to send you my bank details because my f- I still don't have a phone. Well, email them. So I've been without. When people text yeah. you, this, it's just oh. annoying. It means I've got to do an extra. <laughs> Well, the photos are on my phone of the receipt, so I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, you could... I'll get the phone back 
eventually, hopefully this week sometime because I need mm. my phone. Well, did you take that picture, Simon, or is that like one of the default desktops? What, what are you talking about? Your desktop background. Did you take oh, the picture, or is it like a default one? That's a default one. <laughs> oh. I was going to be like, wow, that's so nice. <laughs> the view out my window? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that would be epic, though. Have you been there? I have no idea. It's to do with the operating system. But um, <laughs> it's that thing where, um, like, years ago, I used to make desktops all the time. I just really just can't be bothered. I feel that. Is that Slack? No. I used to do it all the time, but I just don't have time to do it anymore. I watched a TED talk where they said that people that leave default things are not going to be extraordinary people. (laughs) Wow. That can't be right. It's not exactly how it was worded, but people who who change from the default. Customize things. Yeah, they they're more likely to be, um, you know, like amazing or something. They just end up being boring people. Uh, I used you're to not boring, a lot. I yeah, you're, a, you're the exception. I think I just don't even see it or think about it anymore. Um, Fair. And I, if I do start customizing, it, I start to obsess about it a bit. I know that feeling. Fair enough. I get really attached to like a background. Once I set it, it's like, it's going to be that for the next five years. Yeah. This computer's running like a brand new computer too. And it's like, I've got all my uh, desktop cleanup. And that's like literally everything went into that. I backed it up before I took it off to the uh, repairers. Next week, we should have the MBN because the the, guy, the tech guy came and my modem came. I've just got to uh, install it all tomorrow. Then we can watch videos. Maybe. Maybe. Apparently, Tony was playing your videos. He was. And he lives up a tree. How does? How can this be the case? <laughs> <laughs> That's not so bad being a stinky hippie after all. <laughs> Mate, there's no hippies up there. They're all just like rednecks. <laughs> apparently, apparently, people who like Led Zeppelin are stinky hippies, like me and Tony. <laughs> but I don't mind. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not very stinky though. So, what have you? What have you guys got? What do you got for me? I've got a YouTube clip which I've cut and pasted. Watch later. Um, what else have you got? Funny story. I actually went and uh, like went for board games uh, on Saturday, and I actually used the fun fact that like the first feature film was made in Australia. You know, everybody was like, "Whoa!" And I was like, "Yeah, I know stuff." <laughs> Yeah, the first feature film was made in Australia, and it's hilarious to think it was first screened in a in a, in a theatre that like still there. I I go to it sometimes. It's hilarious. So it's not a barn. When, when did that did that come up in Tony's class? No, you mentioned it. Ah, yeah. It's all thanks to you, Simon. I was going to mention it. I was going to mention it some more. Yeah, that's okay. The more you mention it, the more it will sink in. Truth. Yeah, that's true. If you tell me something once, it goes in one ear and out the other. I need to like be told (laughs) like at least nine times before it sinks in. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) <laughs> it's interesting to see whether you, you retain information more from learning online 
going to an online lecture or from a face-to-face -face lecture? I think online's good. I was really weird about it when I first started. But, I mean, this is my second online course that I've done. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It's good. I, I'm liking it. I know, I know when Tony uh, was coming on board, he was really apprehensive about it and he was just going, oh, I don't know if this is going to work. I was just nice. And I had to sort of talk him into it a bit. And he's, he's loving it. He's absolutely loving it. And I thought, that, I thought that might not be the case. So that's good. Um, there you go. Um, I was going to do an extra coaching thing for you guys. I repeated the uh, imposter syndrome thing. Um, I'm still writing my uh, my second one for you. So at some point, I'll get that. I'll get that done. It's, um, it's actual work gets in the way of things, which is really annoying. Yeah, that's okay. We're going away in a few weeks' time too, so I'm just trying to work out what to do. So Tony will will take one of my class, take my animation class, um, and then I'm on, so on the Tuesday. I'm I'm working on getting a guest lecturer in. When's that, Simon? Let me. It's a good point. A good point. I'll have to look at my calendar. When am I going away? Uh, is it next week? Uh, the 28th. Uh, uh, Brittany, quick question. Did you, have you heard anything back from uh, Seacraft? No, not yet. Have you? Oh, okay. No. I think they said July. Yeah, I think the application hasn't closed yet, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I keep I, I get updates from them, and I keep looking to see whether you guys have been been sort of finalised or something. But it's they they're still putting in they're putting in things like wanting um, you know people to do workshops and guest lectures and things like that. So um, and submit papers and things like that, which is what they do for conferences. But yeah, they'll get onto it. I'm going away. Uh, not next week, the week after. Where are you going? No, no, nowhere really fancy. I'm going to Nambucca Heads. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's, it's cold down here and Nambucca Heads just seems warm to me. <laughs> That's I, such I a funny name. <laughs> um, my wife and a friend hired a house. And apparently it's just an amazing house on the beach. And I, I just went, okay, that sounds good. But it's quite a long drive from here. So I've got to drive a day to Sydney. And then a day to Sydney. And <laughs> don't laugh at that. It's not funny. Driving for a day is not funny. The reason I never go away, I never go overseas, because I don't like going on holiday without my dog. <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> really sweet. But the thing is, if I'm on holiday and I'm, <laughs> I'm having a good time, I'll be missing my dog. <laughs> Fair enough. Your dog will probably be missing you, which makes it really heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and, and it's like I found this really good place that my dog can stay. A friend of mine's got a farm, and my dog loves going there and hanging out at this farm. And, um, and I'm sure she'll have a really good time, but you know, it's uh, just the way it is. So is that when the guest lecture is going to be as well? Yeah. So Monday the 1st, uh, Tony will take my class. And I think he thinks it's next week because he said to me, he called me today and says, we need to talk about next week. What do you think? Because I said I was going to write the lecture on it. Just call your boots. And then on the Tuesday the 2nd, um, I'm hoping to get a guest lecturer in. I had somebody really good lined up, but then they couldn't do it. But I'll get them in at the time. So we're not going to have Tony's class then on Tuesday, or is it going to be like two classes? What I'm going to do, I'm doing a, I'm doing a thing where if I'm going to get a guest lecturer in, 
um because i've got to pay them out of my budget i'd rather both cohorts go oh okay see i get sort of more value if if you but if, if like imagine if i said oh there's a guest lecture but it's only for the other guys you'd be like oh well that's no good yeah that's disappointing <laughs> And I think it's good to break it up to, like we factor into to each class, um, a guest lecture um, somewhere during. I think I think it's just good to have a different change of voice. I think you get sick of me. Nah, not yet. <laughs> not true. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? I think it's good to mix it up. And. Um, yeah, it just works out well. So fingers crossed. I'm, I'm, I'm still working on, on, on something. I had a good idea today, so I'm going to work on that. Um, hmm. So what movies did people go and see? I saw I Men in Black Four or Men in Black International with Mum and my sisters. Yeah, I saw that too. Like, I think last night? Yeah, last night. I think I saw it. What did you go and see? To Friday. Men Many, in Black. Uh, Men in oh, Black. Men in Black. Yeah. Cool. Was that any good? Yeah. It's pretty good. It reminded me of like a children's movie with a lot of swearing, though. Like, <laughs> well, I, don't I don't know. I haven't seen the first three in so long, I don't even remember them. <laughs> But no. And I had to go right. with um, my mum and sisters and they were like, they go nuts anytime they see Chris Hemsworth on scene. So I'm like sitting there. I'm like, oh, no. They obviously haven't seen it. Pardon? So they obviously haven't seen Endgame. <laughs> oh, no, they have. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been to see my movie. I feel I feel really slack, but I just haven't, just haven't, just, just haven't carved the time up. It's fair yeah. enough. I keep forgetting every time I go to the movies to get a um receipt. I just never keep the receipt. I mean, I don't even go like to a person to buy. We have like the kiosk, <laughs> so I just don't even get a receipt to begin with. Well, how do you get in? Like a, a ticket. That's what I mean by a receipt. You got the ticket. The tickets. Yeah, good. but then I just leave the ticket like with my drink in the bin in. The <laughs> no, you got <laughs> And my popcorn in the bin. Tax. Yeah, but it's all right. <laughs> it's literally eight dollars for me to see a movie. It's like pocket money. <laughs> See, now you have, you have more budget to get a guest lecture in just because I saved you that $8. Aren't I nice? <laughs> budgets are all siloed. They're all in little, 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 little buckets. Pour my bucket into guest lecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got to, oh. I can't do that. I've got... I've got retention budget, then I've got some guest lecturer budget, and I've got student welfare budget, uh, all, sorts, all, sorts, all sorts of things. I've got, you know, a budget for when I go on holiday so I can pay Tony. Um, yeah. It's cool, it's cool having budgets, actually, because that's a really very, very rare situation in education. And that's why... Um, I got really excited having budgets to be able to do that. That I tell my old students that I stay in touch with that I've got budgets to do stuff like that. They can't believe it. They think it's amazing. It's pretty good. Mm, it's it's completely unheard of. Really? Totally unheard of. Oh, wow. I've I've never come across it. That. One that there's, you know, I can do something to do, so, you know, for you, that's outside of, you know, what we do here. Um, so Collarts is a, is is pretty, it's pretty good in that regard. I've got to say, I quite like it. Hmm. Um, I might just stop recording actually. 
Top record.